Alrighty, folks, it is Thursday night. Guys, welcome to Hunting the Rut Hotline. Folks, you're going to have some questions, and we hope we got some answers for you. Now, listen, tonight is July 7th. We've been talking about it. Dude, we're on the back hill of the mountain. We are literally sliding down the slide, heading toward hunting season. And what I mean by that, guys, you know what I mean by it. It is after the 4th of July all of the dealers and you'll start seeing the difference in what we're saying even in people asking questions up to this point we kind of been thinking about hunting a little bit but now everything's gearing toward getting ready to go hunting listen july august september and 60 uh july august and 45 days less than 45 days the, uh, south carolina the southern zone of south carolina's deer season opens opens august 15th it's crazy. So, now that's the earliest season, but then, you know, the rest of the seasons open up mid-September, late September. But nevertheless, here we are, July 7th, and we're on the downhill slide, and we got some stuff coming in tonight you'll be able to see and you'll find interesting, and, and you can help answer in your mind as you see the graphics, answer the questions that the caller has in about his property. Uh, we touched on that some last week, and... Um, He's been gracious enough to send it in, uh, arrow views and stuff, and, and it's, it's a tech question. You can look at it and you make determinations. And folks, this is the way you find stuff. You, nowadays, you, we used to literally have to fly over and get uh, views of the property. You gotta do that now. You can go on Google Earth and get everything you need. You can see exactly, zoom in on your neighbor's property. And, <laughs> and I'd do that if I was you, because you need to know what's happening on the outside of you that's generating pressure back into your property or is surrounding your property as a cocoon. All of that has pressure. It has an effect on what you're doing. Hey, it's July 7th, and we're going to be talking about that tonight. You stay tuned. We'll be right back. You don't like old milk. Deer don't like old urine. Brown and cloudy urine reeks of ammonia. Ammoniated urine means it's old, not fresh, and it doesn't fool deer. Top Secret Deer Sense, the only scent on the market that's oxygen free from collection to bottle. It's yellow and clear because it's fresh. It's the only scent on the market that says a deer is here now and not last week. Okay, folks, we got several things we want to talk about. A little bit of house cleaning. First of all, we told you last week seminars are coming up. Yep, it's that time of year. And uh, uh, starting in August, you'll be able to see it there. Uh, and you'll see the date and the time, the city. And uh, we encourage you, if you're anywhere near these, these places, these states, these great dealers, we encourage you to come to it. Uh, we're amazed sometimes how far people will drive to be able to come and hear a seminar, and we are certainly grateful for that. And it's humbling to know that you'll come that far to be able to hear, and also uh, to be able to learn. and. Uh, and gain knowledge, but we gain just as much knowledge talking to you in these seminars, uh, just like we do at this show here. Each time, as you'll see later in the show, as we look at these properties and people ask questions, it makes us think about the answer and applying the answer because it is, uh, there are, yes, Chris, nuances to, to everything that we're doing, <laughs> everything we're doing. So guys, have you ever seen The Wizard of Oz? What we need to do is get you guys on camera at least once where they can understand that I'm really talking to somebody over there. Uh, it looks like that's to my right. It's actually to my left, uh, Chris. And then we got big Tom up there and uh, they are, they're behind the curtain, but I can see their butt and uh, they answer this. So when I ask questions at times, they're directing this. So if you want to know why we're in total chaos, there's the two girls right there in the back room. All right. So seminar, <laughs> seminars are coming up. And guys, we do encourage you, look, we're all over the country. You got plenty of time each week. We'll zero in on the one closest to us, but yet we'll show them all the way out. I think we're going all the way out into mid-October this year um, in, in seminars. And believe it or not, we still got people trying to trying to book those. Uh, so uh, look for that. We're coming to a town near you, and you'll be able to be able to ask any kind of questions you want in person. And uh, we always enjoy doing that every year. Okay, another thing we want to be able to do is to let you know uh, the one of three callers tonight, it, we're, we're doing a giveaway, one of three callers tonight, you're going to get your choice 
of a $30 value. Your choice of either estrus or a buck bladder, Chris. We're looking all right. Uh, uh, either a estrus or a buck bladder, $29 value. Never seen uh, oxygen. Guys, this is a great deal. You'll be able to apply it when you're there and it's, the whole time you're sitting in the tree you got a buck or you got a doe standing there because the first time it drips it's the first time it sees oxygen neat value with one of the three callers tonight okay let's uh let's do a couple things all right let's see if we can uh catch up on some questioning and uh guys and we do apologize for this we 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 get a lot of facebook questions we got a lot of email questions and we do uh, sometimes you think, well, gee, he, he never gets to mine. We do, believe it or not. There's times that we do catch up, and we, we do appreciate you doing it. And so, seriously, send them in. We do not not answer any. We answer them all, and we try to go through them as quickly as possible. So we're going to try to clean up a little bit of that first thing tonight. Uh, Big Bob Newcomb, uh, you, everybody knows Bob. Bob's been a caller into the show, and he's asking... One thing has been on his mind heavy, and that's a rifle season in Indiana. He said he's totally against it. What's your thoughts on it? And he says, God bless you all. Well, listen, Bob, every state, you know, manages their own herds. And, uh, you know, one of the things that makes America, America is, and it's directly related to what he's asking is, you know, it, you know, we're, the United States and each state is sovereign in itself and so you know has its own governor, its own legislature and its own uh, 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 DNR so uh, Bobby if that's something you, you know you don't like boy you can take that up and you can vote and guys listen America listen the way you change things is with a vote you vote stuff in you vote stuff out people don't vote shouldn't talk and so uh, Really, Bob, you know, it's, it's, it's a preference. You know, of course, here in Alabama, we have, uh, in Florida, we have a rifle season. Uh, states vary. You know, some states you can, uh, you can use a slug, a shotgun just with the slug. Well, well the concept behind that is they, they didn't want long distance rifling. And states, a lot of states has it where around big cities uh, where it's uh, heavily populated. They don't want you to use a rifle, not just because of the distance that that, that, that cartridge would carry. But, so they wanted to start going to, to rifling, uh, slugs, shotgun. But the problem with that is they started putting rifling <laughs> shotguns and then started putting scopes on shotguns and you just had a bigger rifle. Uh, so, you know, it just varies. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a preference thing, Bob, but uh, it's up to you guys in, in Indiana to decide what it is you want to do, literally. Uh, and hunters ought to have a say in that. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in the hunting industry. There's a lot of stuff going on with guns all over America in this election season, and it is time to talk and time to uh, put your, your vote to make a difference in what's going on, not only in Indiana, but in the country. And, I, and, and now's as good a time as any to mention this. Have you guys seen the latest uh, NRA commercial? Saw it today? Whew. I'm telling you, it's strong. Um, I mean, it, 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 it is the greatest, it, it's the, it's the it's the strongest reaction that I've seen out of the NRA in, in this series of commercials, but it's, it's talking to the elite, not, not only to the uh, political class, but to the elite class in America. You know, um, better pay attention. You're pushing a lot of good people, and a lot of good people is tired of that. So Second Amendment means something, so uh, not only to hunters, but the individuals. So Big Bob, Take it up with the people in Indiana and uh, be lawful with it. All right. Marvin Sw uh, Swain uh, from Iowa. Uh, what does the term lockdown phrase really mean during the rut and how do you hunt it? Well, you know, there's a lot of variations on what the lockdown means, but I can tell you when it is in Alabama. It is mid-December to 1st of January. It is like uh, Marvin it is like, honest, a bomb goes off and every stinking deer in Alabama disappear, even does. Tracks everywhere, can't see a stinking doe. It's the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it's not just bucks locking down, it's just deer in general. And, you know, 
there's been a lot of stuff on what would do it, but it, that, if you look at a big answer, and let's say you're in Iowa, if you look at a big answer on that, um, and you know, I'm not sure in uh, Iowa if that lockdown phrase is, uh, uh, the lockdown is just before the, the peak of the rut. And if, if it is, and it's certainly true in Alabama that that's the case. Uh, some people believe it's pressure, you know, just sim simply a gradual build up of pressure like blowing up a balloon and just before it, it, it goes off. You know, you can only put so much air in a balloon and you can only put so much pressure and then the, the things happen. But I think it's more than just pressure. Um, it's, it's, it's the calm before the storm, which is normally just before the peak uh, as everything builds up. But uh, there's not a clear, decisive answer on that. Marvin, I'd love to give it to you. Uh, we scratch our head just like you scratch your head. I mean, we, you know, it's just, a, there's just, everybody's trying to figure that out. But it seems like it has gotten, uh, and I've noted it through the years, it's gotten uh, a little longer each time. And, and it, it's, it's just on a regular basis. Uh, in Alabama's mid, mid, uh, mid December to the 1st of January, they're locked down. And like I said, no, even the does. So um, not real sure. Uh, we've had that question asked before. And again, still, we don't have a clear decisive because there's so many variations on that in each state. Uh, and, and pressure certainly has a part of that. But I also think just uh, just simply the, the amount of stuff to build up to the uh, peak of the rut also. All right, we've got a top secret website question. Uh, Leon wants to know, and he's from Rising Sun, Maryland. What physical body language or specific, uh, specific movements does a doe use when she's in estrus? Well, first of all, the biggest one you need to pay attention to is she's not running. She's standing. Now, if you're talking about, let's see, let me, uh, when she's in estrus, okay, I, I just wanted to make sure that you're asking when she's in estrus, because I'm, I'm making that distinction there because it's not hard to figure out when she's in estrus because she's not running, she's standing. She literally stands, she's not scooting, she's standing. That means she is in full estrus. She's gonna, she's gonna breed a dominant buck or a young buck. It makes no difference to her at that point. If the, the, whoever's there, and if there's not a big boy that'll stop it, then she's gonna breed. Now, would she prefer an older buck? Yes, a more mature buck? Yes. But when she comes into the peak of the rut, a peak estrus, she'll stand. Cannot deny that. The peak of the rut is just that. It's when the majority of the does are standing. Now, having said that, a lot of times people will ask this question with the concept of that a doe is in estrus when she's running. So you may have the, the twitch of the tail or the estrus bleat you know, she'll make, all that is, uh, most of that is preliminary to her, uh, preliminary to her standing. So, but to clarify, Leon, very important, when she's an estrus, she's standing, she's not running. All of those, the twitching of the tail, that, that estrus bleat that she'll do, that is getting toward getting ready to stand, but she's not there yet. You know, you like your high, high, you know, how, how far is it to the, where we going, Dad? How far is it? How we're almost there, we're almost there. Well, you're not there yet. Now you're there. And that's the way it is with the duck. So, uh, clear sign, she's standing. That's the peak. The twitching, the estrus bleat, you'll start seeing that. And, and, and look, another thing you'll do is if you're sitting in a stand, and people confuse this sometimes because when they'll use estrus, uh, well, how people say, well, you know, I used your estrus, and uh, gee, man, it made a, it, it, it ran a doe off. Oh, really? Well, that's good. And you go, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. Well, think about what it's saying. If you're using estrus, top secret estrus, which is peak estrus, doe standing, and you put it out, and another doe comes in, and she uh, is nervous around it, and she doesn't blow, but she's nervous and she pitches off. That's a good thing. And you say, well, wait a minute, why? And, and, and the reason for that is a lot of times a doe that is coming into estrus does not want to be around a doe that is in estrus. 
Now think about the logic behind that. If this one is in, she's ready to stand. The one that's not in is running, trying to get away from them because she's not ready, and the last thing she wants to be is next to her where there's other bucks. So she don't want. So the first thing she's oh, you know, she don't want to be there. So she, she, it looks like she's running from it, but really what she's doing, she's just getting away from the bucks that would be coming to her. And so sometimes hunters misunderstand what that doe's reaction is. It, there, it, it's, it's saying that bucks would be coming to her versus to, which would irritate her. So uh, pay attention to that. Uh, another Facebook question: uh, Joey Anderson out of Bismarck, North. North Dakota, what do you believe is the best all-around deer hunting gun? Man, that's that's a personal preference. Depends on what part of the country you're in. You know, if you're out west, you're in the southeast. If you're in the northeast, uh, now having said that, I, I I always answer that question with my personal preference. Uh, I have never been a believer in having to gut them when you shoot them. <laughs> uh, dead is dead. And for years, of course, the, the lowest caliber gun you can shoot in the state of Alabama is a 22 250 For years, up to last year, in fact, I have shot a 22 250 with a 55 grain, two-pound trigger. I don't know much in North America, and I want you guys to think about this, I don't know much, many animals in North America, that if you shoot that sucker right behind the ear with a 55 grain, that, that first of all, all that all that is going so fast when it hits, all it's going to do is just explode. It's just going to fragment inside. It's just jail. And so, I'm not trying to uh, gut them. Probably the most popular gun caliber is the 270 around the country. Now, uh, popular just means that's the number one sold. Could that be price? Could it you know? Could it be just branding? Doesn't necessarily means it's the best caliber gun it's the number one sold uh, for instance it's, this would shock this this is probably not true today it would have been true 10 years ago for years it would shock people when I would tell them the number one you, you know the number one bow that's killed more deer probably than any other bow in the archery industry up to about 10 years ago because now it's just exploded and that was a uh, uh, white tail too bear white tail too cheap, inexpensive bow, but a bunch of hunters had it. It wasn't fast, but it was deadly. And if you get enough people throwing arrows at them, and that's what happened. And that was the beginning of the archery industry when it really started to grow, and boy, everybody had it. So it's preference. Um, it, it really is joy. I mean, I, I went to a 243 this year. It's, it's fast, it's flatter, uh, but again, I'm not looking for a knockdown, I'm looking for placement. And um, But if you're going to shoot a deer with a rifle, now me with a, a low, uh, like with a 22 250, I shoot them behind the ear. But if I, with a 243 or 270, certainly high in the shoulder, any other gun high in the shoulder. A lot of hunters make the mistake of shooting a deer. You know, people say, well, where do you shoot a deer? Well, what am I shooting? Well, they say, what do you mean? I say, well, you know, what am I shooting? If I'm shooting a, deer, a, a, a buck or a deer with a bow, then I, this is the deer, and if this is the head, I do not, most people want to shoot a deer right there, what they call the kill zone, the heart lungs. I don't want to do that. And the reason I don't want to do that, if you grow up in Alabama and you shoot that sucker right there, you're going to look forever for that deer and some thick stuff, and you're going to be crawling around with stuff that'll bite you. So what you do is you learn not to do that. Now and you, this is this is a Don Bell preference. Now I'm just telling you my preference, uh, and here's why. But let me give you my logic behind it. This is the kill zone. This is the heart and the lungs. What I tend to do is to wait, as to if this is the head, you're broadside to me. I'm not going to shoot you. I'm going to let you turn away from me. You're almost butt to me, quartering away. And when you do, Chris, can you see my hand there? Good. I'm going to shoot right off of your butt, right behind that rib cage into that uh, section here, and I'm going to put it right behind that rib cage, this opposite shoulder. Now, what I just did is I completely missed all the. I, I, I went, I, I'm trying just not to hit the hip, and I want to go in that soft spot, shoot that outside shoulder. I'm taking all the lungs, I'm taking heart, I'm taking all that. But if you shoot this away, I've got to go through the rib cage. 
You can deflect, you can do all, you can point the rib, you can do all kind of stuff in there. All's bad, but why do that when you can get the deer position? Now, a deer won't always position that. That's the reason why I care a grunt call. Because if you're, especially a hands-free grunt call, because if you're at full draw, and I'm bow hunting now, if I'm at full draw and I'm here and I grunt and there's a deer 20 yards from me, I'm not hesitant at all to grunt that deer. Because if I grunt, eh, that buck uh, deer is going to look, drops his head, eh. now I'm at full draw, I ain't going to do nothing. And of course he's, he's fidgeted, he's looking, and he turns to quarters, then I shoot him. Now, that's just me, but I want that out, I want that quarter and away shot. Now, if you're going to shoot him with a shotgun, what do you do? You shoot him, uh, of course, it depends on what you're shooting with. If you shoot him with slugs, then I shoot him high in the shoulder. If you shoot him here, more times than not, you're going to run that deer. I mean, what I mean by that is you're going to trail that deer a ways. Because you shoot him in the heart, it's like setting that sucker on fire. Really, any animal. And all the ones you know what I'm talking about, you shoot him and he just runs. You see him on film, shoot, heart shot, and he just takes off. Well, he can go a long ways before he bleeds out. So what I do is instead of shooting him here again, well, let's say with a, a slug, shotgun, I shoot him high in the shoulder. If you shoot that deer high in the shoulder, his feet's going to go bloop. He's going to take the full, it's like me coming up there going, hey, versus me walking up to your shoulder and going, hey, you're going to take that full load and it's going to body slam you. All right. Now, so if I'm shooting with buckshot, then I'm going to shoot, I know it's going to sound stupid, this is a Floyd Bellism. Growing up, we grew up on 14,000 acres in, a, in clear cuts hunting. You jump 10, 15 deer at a time. Uh, we were always taught never, if they're flagging, don't pay any attention to them. What we wanted, we were taught to look for the broom sage doing this. Because when you jump deer, does are going to flag. Ah, you know, they're running. Young bucks are going to flag. The tails, are go, as they go off, their tails are going to be bopping. That big buck is going to hunt that ground. He's going to scoot, and all you're going to see is broom sage doing this. And once he gets out there 15, 20, 30 yards, that's when he's going to come up. See, but you're, you're over here looking at all this activity. You need to be looking for what's going on, hugging the ground out there. I say that to say, you, you do if you're doing number ones, triple alts, uh, then I, a double alts, I shoot the nose. And it's a conscious thing to shoot the nose, because you shoot the nose, you're going to put that whole load in that neck. All right? You shoot that neck, that head's going down. He, he ain't going nowhere. So you shoot him anywhere in here to here, he's going down. He may be going around, but he ain't going nowhere. He's he going to be right there. So it's a conscious effort to do that. Now, if, then the question with a shotgun, and this is, this is a semi-long answer for a question, but you, you ask the question. If you're going to load a shotgun, how do you load it? I mean, it, let's say that you can hunt, you, you're in a state like Alabama, you can hunt number, number ones, double alts, triple alts. Uh, this is the way we'd load a gun. In Alabama, you can load a, without a plug, you can have five rounds. We'd load two number ones, two double alts, and a triple alt. Now you know double, triple, double, uh, number one, double, triple, they get less but bigger as you come down. So what happens is that you walk in a clear cut, deer get up, two number ones, you want to be able to put the most pellets on them the quickest. Boom, boom, got on them. You miss. For whatever reason, you've missed. Now they're, they're, they're gaining distance on you. You're coming up. Now you got two double alts. Does it take as many of the double alts as it does the number ones? It's got a further knockdown. You miss him then. You got one last shot at that joker, and that's a little triple alt. In any one of those, but in the right place, is going to bring him down. So how you load the gun makes a difference between short distance going away. Common sense is you want the furthest, the closest, the most, the closest, and the, and the biggest, the furthest. All right, last thing is to the rifle. You shoot a rifle high in the shoulder. Again, for the same reason I'm telling you, you shoot him here, he's going to run. You shoot him high in the shoulder, I'm talking about with a 270 caliber, even a 243 with a right round uh, will take him down high in the shoulder. Okay, so and then I'm talking whitetail. Uh, so, Joy, I'm assuming that we're talking about whitetail here and not 
mule deer or elk or something like that. All righty, uh, long, long answer there, wasn't it? Okay, well, can we go to another one? Okay, one more, he says. All right, Big Frank out of, is it Maston, Wisconsin? Well, we're skipping all over the place tonight. Why do bucks separate and go their own way once deer season opens? During the summer, they stick together, not a problem at all understanding that. It's July 7th. Your property has had very little to no pressure on it. Constant pressure, believe it or not, is a good thing. Constant pressure is judgeable, meaning that the same pressure is a norm. It's the irregular pressure that gets the deer all screwed up because they don't know when it's coming or what it's doing. But if it's just a regular pressure, then they will react to it or get used to it as a norm. Okay, what's happening right now is that all over the country, bucks are in bachelor groups. They were in bachelor groups since January. Season ended last year everywhere in, Alabama, uh, everywhere in the country. Uh, doesn't matter what state you're in, bucks started getting back together in bachelor groups. Well, they're running in bachelor groups right now. It shocks most people when I remind them that bucks are more concerned with bucks 99% of the year than they are with a doe. Guess when she, he's, he's interested in a doe? Peak of the rut. Outside of that, that old boy's running with other bucks. He's more concerned with other bucks. His life is geared around other bucks. Now, having said that, once they se bucks separate, why do they go once deer season opens? You, just that. What's open? Deer season, which means what? you got pressure in the woods. Well, they're going to react to that pressure, and that pressure varies within even uh, short distances of pro property that people own. Some people hunt every time the door, every daylight. Some people won't understand but once a month. Uh, they, some people's got thousands of acres, they take two deer off it. Pressure is directly related to that. So um, they stick together pressure. It's a lot of it is we overthink it. And a whitetail is a very elusive animal, the most elusive game animal in North America. But the rascal is phenomenally predictable. They're habitual. Um, and so, therefore, you know how to react to them. And sometimes you can put a false pressure on them to make them do something that you want them to do, even. Uh, so, um, all right. Let's uh, go to a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. From Don Bell, the founder of Code Blue, comes top Serve Doe Esters, the finest Doe Esters ever collected. Top Secret Oxygen Free Collection Process is a complete generation above Code Blue. Our patent pending collection process means no ammonia and no ammonia smell. At a limited quantity of 12,000 bottles, only one tenth of one percent of hunters will be lucky enough to add Top Secret to their arsenal. Visit TopSecretDeerset.com today and join the one tenth of one percent club. Now, some of you need to pay attention tonight. Look up there above my shoulder. Yep, it's the one-tenth of one percent club, and folks, listen to me. There's some bottles still left. If you want yours, you've got a chance to join the club tonight. It is July 7th, and as we turn that peak, as we're going, and as you'll start seeing in the second half of the show tonight, all hunters are geared toward the fall now. They're thinking about it. Uh, the, all the classics will start kicking off. You see my seminar schedule. It's on. It's all about fall now. So everything's gearing up. Now, folks, you can have all the knowledge in the world, and it is phenomenally important to have knowledge. You also need a little bit of secret there, will you? And that's some top secret esters. Well, you can join the club. You know how it goes. If you're a regular member, if you're a new member tonight to the show, you can be a club member. You don't buy, you, you don't purchase a membership. The way, the only way you can be a member of the one-tenth of one percent club is just that, is you buy a bottle of reserve. Those that you've seen the show, you know that that's 26 ounces. It's a flat $100 bill. Uh, people kid us all the time. You know, how in the world do you sell a $100 bottle of deer here? And it's not hard. Because the people that are serious about deer hunters, serious about attracting the deer, this is 26 ounces of a three, four-year-old single doe. It's never seen the oxygen. And you can't say that bad boy doesn't work because we literally pulled the buck off of the doe. We have 12,000 bottles, which means Think about it, there's uh, 12 million deer hunters, one-tenth of one percent. Only one-tenth of one percent will even get a bottle. The question is, or, or is there, are you one of those one-tenth? If you want their very best, this is it. Guys, here's the way you join. 
It's a hundred dollar bill. You can hit the website right there tonight. You can hit the button below me. It says uh, uh, you can go now buy button. You'll see it right there. You join it one or two ways. You can buy it tonight. Hit it and say, you know what? Uh, Don sent it to me. I want to pay for it now, and I want you to send it to me uh, November the 10th or October or December. Whenever you want us to do, send it to you, we'll send it to you. The most popular way right now to do it is option two, which means it's a four uh, pay, not four play, <laughs> but four pay. And what that means is, is you can hit that credit card four times, $25 a month, and folks say, hey, Don, I want you to send it to us in November whenever you want it. We'll do that. Uh, it's not that mama don't know. I'm just saying mama may not know that she bought you something for Christmas and you put it on the credit card. I'm just saying. Now, the last thing you want to be able to do is know we also have it in the buck. This is the bucks that we pull off them does. You can join the club either way, whether or not you use the buy the estrus or the buck. But just a reminder, there's only about 1,100 bottles of this. Buck is actually harder than the dough to get because we have less bucks than we do does. Common sense says that. So this is, is, it doesn't cost more, but it's the first to leave. So, but you can join the club either way. You can buy both either way you want to do it. Once you're a club member, nobody can take that bottle away from you. It's yours every year until such time you give it up. But hey, once you give it up, I can tell you, it's like buying season tickets at Alabama. You get to watch Alabama win another national championship, except you're going to do it on TV versus sitting on the 50 yard line. All righty. Let's see, guys, where are we at? Uh, I believe we got a caller on the line. All righty. All righty. You got Don Bell. Who are we talking to? This is Dave Enright from Preston, Minnesota again. All right, Dave. I, I appreciate you calling back. I heard that you got us some graphics we're going to throw up here, and we're going to talk about your piece of property. Uh, tell, tell everybody again now, Preston, where in relation to the cities are you? Kind of put us in perspective what part of Minnesota you're in. All right, the Twin Cities are about 120 miles northwest of here. So we're down, Rochester is like six, 35 miles be northwest of here also. Okay, so you're northwest. So you're really in the, the southeastern corner of Minnesota. Yeah, um, Iowa is only about 20 miles okay. straight south of us. Okay, all right. A good area. I <laughs> mean, good area. All right, so uh, what we're going to do... Uh, Dave, can you see the screen? Can yes, you? I can. I see there's a little bit of time lapse difference yeah, between. Yeah, that, that's the okay. Well, we'll throw the uh, we'll throw the uh, field guys. Everybody listening and watching, what we're fixing to do, guys. If you'll throw the uh, pictures up there, uh, and what we're doing here is, Dave has sent us uh, an air view of his property. Now. We got they we got a split screen. The one on the left, uh, that's the same one, guys. Uh, flip that. Uh, are you seeing two on the screen or one? There you go. All right. The one that's on the screen, I think it's the south side. The red dot, Dave, is on the bottom right. Now, describe the property to us there. Okay. So. <clears throat> And we'll the show the second side. half. We're talking about What's this that? half. We're going to show the second half of it after we talk about the first half here. So the one I'm looking at is the one that's showing the fields, and the orange dot is on the bottom right. I believe that's the southeastern corner. Am I correct on that? Okay. And so due north, everybody watching, you see the north signal in the arrow in dead center of the field there. Okay, take us through it. Okay, so if you go in the southeast corner there where that red dot is, there's that is one of the stands that I've had the most uh, contact with large dominant bucks um, getting hung up in that tree line. And as you hit farther south, you can see the contour is there. It drops off really steep really quickly, and it's thick. I mean, it's very thick. All right, let me, um, let me ask you just a real quick question then. See, is that a road to the left coming in? What that is, it's an old highway. It's turned into an ATV trail, okay, um, a snowmobile trail. So it gets traveled with ATVs during the summer, and then they close it down about the week before bow season opens. How far does your property line? Does it come to the trail? Pretty close, yeah. Okay. So what's south of the trail? The south of the trail, the valley starts to rise up again. 
and connects to our neighboring property. And then once you get up on top there, there's uh, agricultural fields. And then it butts into the other family farm that we own. Um, that's about six or seven hundred acres. Okay, and so you know, a lot of times people ask, you know, what about this or that. So as everybody can see the screen, take just a second, Dave, and tell us what's around this property. We're talking about 200 acres. Uh, they're about 200 acres. So south of you, guys looking at the screen, off screen past that white trail there, south of that is farmland that you control. You part uh, one of that hillside that's to the south of that trail. We don't control. That's a neighbor's property. Do they hunt it? Uh, very minimal. They okay. Used, they, last year they didn't at all. Okay, so very little pressure on that south side. Uh, what about the east side where the the uh, the dot there is? What's what's on that eastern sh flank of it? Okay, so the eastern side it goes up and it starts to narrow off to a pinch. And there's a pond there, and then if you look at the westernmost, southwesternmost flag, those the flags are actually tree stands, and that flag is actually a fence line for property. All right, so, so agri agricultural land up on top that's corn, hay, and soybeans. And I believe and you you said that the everybody watching, and you, you described this well, Dave, as and this is well thought out. What you're doing is you're planting. You're planting corn in the center, you're planting beets, and then you're planting soybeans closer to the field? Actually, it's the other way around. We do corn on the outside closest to the field. Like, okay, so if you take count one, two, three, four, four flags from the west side. Okay. That right there, if you zoom in on that, that's actually a food plot. And on the northern side of that food plot, by that just below that flag, is a corn. And then in the center, we do sugar beets, and we have a water tank. And then on the south side is soybeans. And I actually plant soybeans in with the corn, um, just to give them a good mixture. Now, that's in the plot, or is that in the big field above the flags? No, that's just in the food plot. In the field above, it actually it varies you know, every year, because we've got a heavy rotation. But like at this picture, this is from last fall, I believe. It was alfalfa, and then corn, and then soybeans is the orange. And then there's corn and uh, soybeans again. Do, do you control what's north of the fields, the, the where the planted fields are? That's it, that's showing the second screen, correct? Yes. Uh, okay. This whole section here, uh, and then this is is the south side when i did this uh the property is divided by a highway and on the other side of that highway the north section that we control also and that's what the other slide is okay all right now all right when i when i first saw this we're talking about 200 acres now we just put the other one up there um uh, so the two properties are separated by a road, which, you know, you're talking about 200 acres, uh, that's, that's, that's not an issue. They're, they're used to the road, you know, that they'll cross that road with no problem. Uh, but you got, these, are you only bow hunting? We bow hunt all the way up until the gun season, which the first gun season in Minnesota is usually the first weekend, sometimes the second weekend in November. So you're, you're just, just, you're you're at the begin. I mean, about well into the peak of the rut there. Then, yeah, things really start to get interesting when the first gun season starts. Unfortunately, it's usually in the middle of the rut, which right is hard for the, for the bow hunters. But we gun hunt too. Well, uh, you know. Well, the reason I'm saying that these fields, uh, every one of these flags is a tree stand. Yep. All right. How many people hunt the property? Typically, there's just three of us, but four of us generally. Okay. All right. So now then, uh, if if you can, Tom, if you go back to the first screen, the first field. All right. Bottom right. Now, one of the things that you said is, and you even said it here tonight, is that where you're seeing your largest bucks is in that southeast corner there. Guys, this watching, that's that the orange red dot there. Now. Notice the the uh, 
you can see by the topo, you can see that it drops down. Everything drops down. Is there water coming into that field anywhere? Does that ravine have water in it or no? No, the, the water run doesn't hold. It's too steep. It doesn't hold water. But that's where we get the water tanks from that very first food plot. Uh, or did a water tank. And actually, we have another water tank. All the way up in the northwest corner, you'll see a flag that's in a small grump clump of trees that's a pond that actually does not hold water. If you go straight down to the wood line or point right south of it, we have a water tank there. So the water, the one that holds water the best is the one on the first slide here, uh, up around the food plot there in dead center, third, fourth flag over. Yeah. Um, okay. The north, the north section, there is water runs down there, and there is actually a spring of some sort in there that does hold water year-round, a minimal amount. Um, and that's the thickest, nastiest valley, very hard to access. Uh, the only way I have ever succeeded in getting down in there without blowing things out is go in there an hour before first light and walk down a water run that's uh, 50, 60 feet deep and all big, you know, granite-style boulders, uh, yeah. uh, bedrock boulders, right? and sit in there all day long. Is the back to the all right now? We're we're looking at the uh, the southeastern corner of the first slide with a trail coming through it. Uh, you're saying that this is where you've encountered your biggest bucks most consistently, or just your biggest bucks? Where are you seeing the most buck activity? That location has been. Uh, probably the best activity uh the largest bucks have been shot within 100 yards from that stand are they um, are they are they being shot coming out of the uh, on the edge are they being shot closer to the field or back in 100 to, how far is it from the field to to the levine there okay from the red dot to the field is 30 like 33 yards to the crop field there and all the stands are roughly within that 33 yards along the edge okay. of the woods and then to that other it's the very first food plot is a crow flies it's about 250 yards well to to the ravine uh, to the ravine itself there it's about 150 yards okay are you shooting these deer within the timber line walking not the edge of the ravine but you know keeping keeping the field keeping off the field are you killing them coming to the field and are they coming out of the ravine or are they coming out of off off screen to you in other words they're coming off of somebody else's property as a pinch point going into the field or are they just skirting the field They've been skirting the field on the inside. We have an ATV trail that runs the whole perimeter of that wood line. Right. And what right. they do is they come up from behind that red dot there, generally, and they'll cruise that food plot below the red dot, and they'll head, depending upon what the wind's doing and where, they're bed, where the does are bedded, and they'll cruise. To cruise that, they're cruising that, that, that ATV trail. Yeah, and then yeah. they'll cut off yeah. uh, and go down that steep ravine and come up by the first food plot and yeah. cruise through there. What they're doing is just the same thing. What They're doing exactly what you just said you didn't want to do, which is true. It's, it's, it's in human nature. It's in animal nature. Why would they go through the, the deep ravine when they can skirt it? And notice what they're doing. They're, they're, they're going the easiest route, which is an open route, which is what you did, without getting out into the field itself. So they're just skirting looking. But... Again, are those bucks coming, looking at your dot, are they coming dead south? Uh, let's see here, that would be south. Yeah, are they coming from south due north to that dot, or are they coming off screen to the dot? I'm trying to get a, really an idea where these bucks are bedding. And is it now, when you say you're seeing your biggest bucks, is this during the peak of the rut? Just is, before, yeah. Are, like I said, the last week of October. Are they cruising? Are they cruising or are you hunting scrapes? Both. Um, 
that whole red dot there generally has got a bunch of birch and poplar saplings. That's all tore up. Uh, some of the largest rubs we're talking thigh thick rubs okay. throughout that whole section in there. Um, scrapes all the way up and down along all of those tree stands. There's scrapes. So you're you're seeing these bucks mostly moving from the right to the left, following your uh, ATV trail up around, crossing the ravine there, going to the other plot. Now, what's the distance between this field from the tree, tree line north to the other piece of property? How far? In other words, are you? Um, it would be right up to the other wood line. The closest possible spot would be right around 500 yards. Okay, so, but you, so you really, you're seeing two different set of deer, is what you're hunting. I mean, you're, these deer aren't necessarily crossing that field. They are. Um, that's where it varies. Um, we've got with our trail camera set up, we run about five five trail cams, and what we're finding out they're doing is they'll start on that north property with the red dot. They're yep. bedding and down in that valley and they're making a circle. They're either heading east and crossing the road down below on the neighbor's property, coming up around over to the other property that's not on the picture that we can, right. our family owns, coming back down around to the south property and going through that and then going up to the far west side of the southern picture there and crossing over behind the farm and going back down that valley making a, a big circle is what they do. Right, yeah, and 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 folks that's listening with the cameras, you're you're not just saying deer activity. You're seeing the same bucks. You're seeing a buck there, uh, the same buck here, the same buck there, and you can tell he's circling, which is you know uh, common. Uh, you know they have a range that they're they're going to work in, but you know we, where you set up on this, uh, you know obviously they're cruising that that line. Uh, what about all these stands? I mean, you got a, you got a bunch of stands in a very short period of, like for instance, look at the one uh, from the red dot. Everybody, at the bottom right is one, two, three. I'm going northeast, uh, northwest. I'm just going up left, up the timber line. One, two, three, and then there's one out in the field. Now, is that a draw that 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 goes up? Yeah, there's a draw from the from the red dot into the next stand to the left. There's a draw that comes up in there, and there's actually three rock cliffs in there. The, in yeah. the field itself. What's that? In the field. I'm uh, look No, I, down in the woods behind the stands to the to the south of those stands. There's right. Three rock cliffs. Well, I'm, so the, the, here we'll, we'll funnel up in between them. What about the stand that's out in the field? That stand out by itself, there's a lone tree out there, and there's a bunch, there's a CRP section there that's about a quarter of an acre below it. And that stand has been a good observation stand, so we can see them where they're coming off the neighbor's property onto ours. And generally, what will happen is you get closer to the last week in October, over the years, the does will come out from. The uh, two stands to the west of the red dot, and they'll cut straight across that field up to that stand out in that lone tree. And that point there, uh, for some odd reason, it's a focus point for the deer. But my dad sat underneath that stand and had seven deer that were all over 130 inches. Yeah. Well, from all different directions with eight does. Well, here's a question Is that you know, you're saying it's about 500 yards, you know, from across that open field. Yep. Now, you're planting this cover crop for hunting, right? You're not farming it, you're planting it for cover, or are you planting it and farming it? And all the cropland, the agricultural stuff is all done uh, for uh, cash cropping. Okay. So my uncle takes care of that. That's his. And he, he takes that out, and he's usually. So well, the, the first wants to get his stuff off. Yeah, so that's no problem. But what I'm saying is, so the corn is gone typically by the uh, peak of the rut. They had just cut it. 
Because a lot of times, the reason I'm asking that is that, you know, a lot of times you, you see activity and it changes, especially in Iowa. Uh, anywhere you got standing corn, the deer live in the corn. You know, they, in Iowa, they ain't got anywhere else to live but live in the corn. And when they cut the corn, you know, they travel the, the drainage ditches into just the wood lots there because it's a flat. You'd be surprised how many of these bucks are bedding up in that corn out there because there's not that great cover. They got they got food. They got everything they need. They got safety. There's nothing that's hard to slip up on them. But once they cut cut that stuff, they'll start traveling those ditches. Is there any drainage ditches? And looking at it, it looks like there's three or four going up through that field. Is there that is, and they all funnel down to the right. one. If you see where the 350 meter mark is there in that sharp angular where right. it curves, that's a very steep water run that they cross just south of that 350 meter mark. Are they crossing that field anywhere, you know, from north to south? along those drainage ditches? Yes, there's yeah. two spots that they primarily do that at. Okay, and, and do they change that path once they cut the corn? Yes, um, that's one of the things that I wanted to mention to you right. Ronald, about it, is once, since my uncle gets his corn off first, then we'll see a dissipation of these bucks for a little while. Yeah, because uh, they're, they're traveling. So what's happening is you've cut their common core. That's, this is, this is, is typical, and a lot of times, Dave, we overthink deer. Deer are just like us. You know, if, if we go to the grocery store every day, and we're going to go to the shortest grocery store that we feel safe going to. If people start shooting and killing people around that place, you're not going to go there anymore, right? Or if, you know, if they're working on the asphalt or the road, you're going to detour it. Well, they're living in this corn, and they're covering the shortest distance between two, di the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, you know, and deer being lazy like they are, and pe that, that shocks people when I tell them that, but they are, they're going to come down. The first pressure you're seeing on this property is a natural pressure, and it's a seasonal pressure, is that the covers, the cut, the cut farming it, right? So now they're, they're going to adjust. It just happens that your adjustment's just ahead of the peak of the rut on this piece of property, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So now that's the, one of the reasons they skirt in this thing, but once they start running does, peak of the rut, you know, uh, you know, 7th to the 15th of November, where you are, Historically, are you, are they running them in the timber, or and that's all hardwood, right? Yeah. All right. Are they running them in the timber or any in the fields? Some in the field. It depends what the population has been like. We've had a few years there where the buck to doe ratio was uh, seemed to be higher bucks. Then yeah. we see them not, not wide open out in the field five bucks chasing each other around chasing one doe. Okay. Otherwise, for the most part, generally, especially on the north side of the road, um, I've had as early as the first week in October, two year young bucks chasing a doe and just grunting like crazy. And she was actually estrus calling in there's two spots that they do it. It's very tight, very secluded area, and it's primarily in timber. Well, I know this is going. I know this is going to sound stupid to most people, and I am bad on analogies now. But you know, human nature being what it is, you know, people that are married, you know, they they go spend a little quality time with mama. Most people spend quality time with mama in the in, in the bedroom. That's the reason you call it the master bedroom. But human nature being what it is, you know, uh, it can it can happen in other places. But historically, you know, you you got a you got a a, a, a rhythm, right? And these deer get this rhythm, and that's the reason why I'm saying it the last two weeks. Hey. Dude, it's on. It's July 7th. And everybody, so now that rhythm starts picking up, but you have a unique, I don't say unique, but you, the situation that your uncle's on that property, tractors are on it, you know, people's on it, you know, so, and then the pressure changes after season because they're not traveling that, that snowboard trail till what? After gun season? Yeah, they don't hit the snowmobiles until 
know, December. Right. So, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of sandwiched in all that. And I, I don't see anything that you're doing wrong. Are you seeing your lesser bucks on the north piece of the property? You know, it's been spread out. Um, it's pretty equal. Uh, the valley, they're both big valleys. And that actually, the north valley, they're it's probably more secluded than this South Valley. But you're seeing better bucks over here on the south side? Generally, because of what we found out over the years is the south side tends to be a doe habitat in a nursery. Right. And so, therefore, the bucks are coming to the does. Yep. Yeah. So, which is, again, you're seeing the and we're, I'm, we're compressing all this within the peak of the rut within you know two week period of time ten day period of time here so but your bucks are scattered across the property they're more congregated here during the peak obviously because where the does are oh um, where's the biggest buck you killed off the property bow or gun you know on, on north or south um, the south. Um, in fact, it was the stand with the red dot, the stand to the left of that one. All right. Now, let me ask the same question with a variance. Where's the area that, you, which side of the property did you see the biggest, you've ever seen the biggest buck on? I don't care when you saw him. What time of year it was? Um, it was. If you, see, if you go up to the second flag on the northwest there and that grove of trees, small little grove of trees, and okay. I told you there's a pond in. Yeah, are we on the south side? Are we on the south property or the north property? The south property. Okay. There, right at the tip of that wood line, we seen the largest buck uh, that's ever been seen on any of the properties that we're aware of. Um, or, yeah, he, he's, he, he's a monster. Yeah. Well, you may have just a situation the bucks are in the deep uh, ravine on the north side and they start moving into the does. Of course, you know, they're going to be in and around the does anyway, but they're certainly going to hang around where the, the does are. And of course, the does going to be around the food source. Uh, so I don't see anything you got wrong going on. How long have you had the property managing and hunting it? Um, well, the, fam the farmers have been in the family for over 125 years. It's been hunted since at least 40 years, and we recent, recently started managing it probably about 10 years ago was when we started really managing it. Well, listen, uh, if, if Dave, seriously, I'm not blowing your skirt. If, if ever Hunter would do what you're doing here is to take a uh, – uh, and it's, it's easy to do now. I mean, you know, Google Earth. And, and I, I, I said, it, you can, you know, you play around on somebody else's piece of property because what's going on on them makes a difference. Zero in and see what they're planning. Zero in and seeing how many stands they have. All that is pressure reacting to you, to you. And if hunters that's listening, if you'll do this, and you can do this now, it's, it's simple to do. Know not only what's on your property, know what they're doing around your property because that is a direct result of what's going on because you can control your property. You can't control what's going on the other property. You know? So, and, uh, sorry, not uh, no. trying to interrupt there, but my question, the big question that I had for you that, that stand with the red dot there, um, I had, my, I know two separate occasions of uh, Boone and Crockett size box um, hung up, snort wheezing at me. And I was snort reasoning them back at them. In fact, the one we did that back and forth for 45 minutes, and I couldn't draw him off. Yeah. Well, a grunt snort, typically when a buck does a grunt snort, uh, he's, 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 uh, he's, he's dominant. He's, uh, you're in his bedroom, and it's the most aggressive sound a white tail will make. Typically, sometimes when, well, a lot of times when a, a butt will do a grunt, snort, wheeze, he's like a gobbler. You, I think we talked about it last week. Do you turkey yeah. hunt? Yeah. All right. You know, then you know how sometimes he'll be gobbling his head off and he stay, he, he's hung up on a tree or a fence or something, a creek or something, and he's not coming any further. He's hung up. So you either got to stop and go around him and call him back away from it. Well, sometimes that's what you have to do with a buck like that is that's where you need a decoy. That's, you, you know what I'm saying? Can you, do you hunt with decoys? 
Yes, I have, and I have had good luck on it, um, but it hasn't uh, been that fruitful because of the way that those valleys are. Is where once you get in that wood line there, you got about ten yards where it drops off steep. Yeah, and so you'll they don't either they don't see it because it's thick enough, or they're too smart to come out and find out. Well, you know if he's doing a grunt snort. He's he's already heard. He's went down when he's smelling. He's confirming. Uh, he's saying, "Hey, dog, I, I, come on, come come across. I dare you come across this this line." But a lot of times he'll draw the line in the sand and he'll hang up and not want to come all the way in. But he can see. So sometimes if you have that decoy there, then you can actually uh, uh, give him that last visual. You can whip his ears with a grunt call or rattling. You can whip his nose with scent, but you've got to confirm. Most of the time you whip those two, you, you, you got a shot at him. Uh, I, I'd say the far majority of the time you got a shot at him. But if he's smart enough, old enough, and, and if he's nocturnal, then you're, you're going to need to, uh, or if he's hung up on you, then that last one is that visual. And as crazy as it is, a lot of times I'll, I'll take one side of the horn off of the decoy. Uh, and just leave one side up. And what that looks like, he's already had his butt kicked. You know, so yep. um, have you tried to use a, a, a decoy with, yes. with, have you ever had a decoy out when you had a grunt snort wheeze? Yeah. Um, and still didn't have? No, he, he didn't, he was too hung up and I don't really know what the scenario was, why he didn't come out. I mean, everything was there. And well, I tell you what, do then. Have you heard this? This it, that's happened to you more than once in this stand. Yes. All right. Here's what I do then. Uh, this year, you you know you'll be able to find it at any of the hunting stores up there. You know, you can Walmart, Cabela's, uh, Dunham's, uh, you know, Shopco, uh, any of those stores up there, you'll be able to find it. But we came out with a a one ounce spray. Now, one of the reasons we came out with a spray is, is because of that final dose, meaning that I'm sitting there and you're hung up out there, and uh, most of the time he's going to be hung up downwind, right? So what you can do is give him another dose of buck, not estrus. Uh, it is, are you using estrus or buck urine? Um, the times that I've had them hung up, has it been asterisk? Um, yeah, yeah. Never, you won't buck really urine. Use buck, but yeah. it's been, uh, we use it more as, like you said, a threat. So we'll, yeah. we'll you, it you, you want to use buck urine and, and carry you uh, this little one ounce spray bottle with you in there of our buck urine. And then what you want to do, he gets hung up, you just give him some doses of fresh buck urine. Because what you're telling, it's like you coming home tonight after the show, you're smelling old spice cologne, flip the light on, see your wife. Dude, you're not looking for your wife, are you? <laughs> no. No, right. Now, what that buck has done, he's come in, he sent something. He's got a grunt, snort, wheeze as a challenge. You need to put in his nose exactly what his butt thinks he's smelling. And he will come in. He'll come in with them ears laid back, at tail tucked in. We've got them on field because old eyes bug out. And look, they're pure stiff leg coming in. Have you ever seen a fainting goat on TV? Yeah. Dang, they'll look just like a fainting goat before he falls. He'll be so stiff legged coming in. We've had them come in with just urinate when they're coming in. Uh, so get you some buck urine. And especially if it's that hot, Man, I'd be laying the buck urine on his butt. Try that this year, and uh, try that this year, and keep us in as you're going through season. Call us and let us see what. Now that we've got the map, we can directly talk about what you're seeing in the progression up to the peak of the rut. There. Yeah, that would, I'm. I'm all for that. Um, uh, you know, we can do once the season starts. I'm willing to call in whenever and kind of go through updates and see what we can lay. Yeah, because because now we got a, we've got a visual, got a piece of property, and we can kind of see the progression of the movement of the deer to that that pressure. I mean, to that point where you're seeing most of these deer. Let's see if it stays true this year. 
Uh, that's carry that's carry some buck urine with you in the spray to be able to give him a good dose of it. You need to be using it, but if he hangs up, that way you can put it in the air. If you just pour it out, it's not going to get to him as quick as if you missed it to him. All right? All right. I'll All right, man. Well, David, listen, man, we appreciate you calling in and sharing it with us. And uh, this is the way people learn. And, uh, Dave, we look forward to talking to you again. That's the same here. I can't wait to do it again. All right, man. Dave, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, folks, listen, you can see it. Seeing is believing. You'll be able to trace this. We'll follow Dave through the season and see on that piece of property, and let's see if it stays true and if what we're talking makes sense and whether or not he gets a buck off of doing it. It's not complicated. Ears, eyes, nose, habitual deer. Folks, it's the 7th. Next week, it's going to be the 14th or thereabout. It's deer season coming on. All right, folks, we'll see you next Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Tell your friends, call in.